I'm Jester C. And I'm Ryan Higa. And we are founding partners of the Yum Yum F Network. We are. Mm -hmm. Welcome to our very first installment of our new ongoing series, Yum Yum F Classics. We will share influential films and programs that our viewers may not be familiar with. Uh, and the first film we want to share is Evan Leong's 2003 documentary, BLT Genesis, about the making of the landmark film Better Luck Tomorrow. This is the movie that launched the career of our Yam Yam F founder, director Justin Lin. Lin, Lin. We feel this is the appropriate choice for the first Yam Yam F classic selection because, well, without this film and its success, the Yam Yam F network wouldn't even exist. Our network is a direct result of the journey that began with BLT. This is also the 10th anniversary of the 2002 debut of the film at the prestigious Sundance Film Festival, where it was purchased and released by MTV Films. Our very own Sun Kang, Roger Fan, and John Cho were just some of the Asian American actors who were a part of the film. Not only was it a benchmark in Asian American cinema, but in American independent film too. In addition to running Yam Yam F, Justin is now in London directing the sixth Fast and the Furious movie. Oh, I cannot wait! Patient. Did you see Fast Five? I did. It was amazing. So good. Yeah, Remember I... that that one part where they're they're like driving away with the safe, and then you think that the money is still in the safe, and then when they're walking away, you're like, oh man, they're giving the money back, and then the rock opens it up. This film was such a labor of love. We, we expected the highest, and every step of the way, it happened. Underlying definition of BLT is opportunity. I am extremely blessed to have this as a first role. I've always wanted to do something that was important, something that was gonna change something. Opportunity for today and tomorrow. For me and every other Asian American out there. I feel like the casting for our family. Like all the other guys are like all my older brothers and... The toughest film I've ever worked on, but the most fun I've ever had on any film. Filmmaking is a process where you really need to have a team. You know, it's not having just one individual, but you need everybody to be on the top of their game. What the fuck are you talking about? The cast and crew of this film really worked well together, and it was amazing the teamwork that everyone exhibited and how much we got accomplished. This film definitely has an Asian American perspective, but at the same time, it has universal elements that everyone can relate to. When we wrote this script, we sat down thinking about issues or dealing with issues like teen violence and teen angst and just youth culture and what it's going through today. We've all gone through film school, Asian American classes and stuff, and they always talk about positive portrayals. But I think that that word positive, quote unquote, is very loaded because positive portrayals a lot of times could be misconstrued for having them as good people, you know, good people on screen. But I think that you can't do that with a film like this. We didn't want something that people could just turn off in their mind the minute that they exit the theater, just leave it behind in the darkness. We wanted something that people would think about. Please shut up your walkies, pagers, cell phones, beepers, speed, and chainsaws. This whole process is kind of like, you know, I could equate it to almost like a scrappler boxer. He's like, we're like the little guy that goes in the ring and we're just getting punched. You know, all the way from fundraising to production to post-production, you're just getting punched from all directions. And it's an uphill battle, but you know, that's that's how it is, you know, in the independent film world. Action! 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 Action!
Action. Action. I was sitting across with, with Perry, Jason, and Sung, and the funny thing was, we were all going through the exact thing at the exact same time. We're you cannot go on or keep ringing my bell! You disturb me! You know karate? Uh, no. Good. <laughs> Delivery from Happy Garden. Yeah, I just put it right over there. Okay. Oh, thanks for coming so fast. I'm dying for those cold sesame noodles. The most we can hope for is like the third lead, you know, never the guy that this film centers around. That time in my life, you know, I was like really beginning to question whether there were roles out there that I would be right for. For years I dreamed of coming to America where I could be free and now. I was at a point in my career where I didn't know I could keep going. <laughs> These one-dimensional characters have they, they, have a, they have a mold already. And if you don't fit that mold, you're not going to be able to play that character. Don't you see I'm lurking here? I think in terms of Asian American female roles that have been given have been always like stereotypical roles. I think all of us are, are, are usually pretty frustrated when we do see an Asian American on screen. How do you spell? Well, you don't spell it, so you eat it. <laughs> Either they're like a tourist or a doctor or whatever. They're usually there for an Asian reason. When Better Luck Tomorrow came along and I looked at the script, I was like, holy cow. The reason why I want to be an actor is to do roles like this, that have depth and range, you know? It's like, yes, finally. What a fucking blessing, man. What, I mean, what an amazing opportunity as an artist, as an actor. Top right. Uh, top right. Top right. Over there, and back, uh, back there. Like In front of that lamp. There is no entertainment over there. They don't want to go. Some weird reason. This dynamic occurred where we all felt safe around one another. We trusted each other. Part of the ideology of our film set was that we were a family. What was amazing was there was so much love on that set. Roger Fan has a call time of three o'clock, and. Lunch is being served at 11. Why is Roger Fenn the first one in the lunch line? You didn't need to go home. You're like, it's call time's at 3. It's 11 o'clock. We just got here at 10.30. I mean, after I shot, I would hang out for hours. I'm sitting there going, is this guy homeless and destitute? Does he not have food? Days I wasn't shooting, I'd come back just to hang out. But I realized it's not, it wasn't about food. It wasn't about that. It was about being around there, just being a part of it. Because it was so much fun to be on that set. Because every moment for him was so precious. And stuff like that set the tone of what Better Luck Tomorrow became. I wanted to make a film where if there was a basketball scene, I did not want to have like a shot of someone shooting and then we cut to the ball swishing, which required Perry to, you know, to really practice. So for three weeks, seven days a week, for four hours a day, I shot free throws in the park. I went there to practice after he was cast and the guy had made one free throw out of ten and he banked it in, which was luck. Justin would just he would teach me, he was like literally showing me, you know, you got to have a rhythm. The, the pattern is backspin, catch it, bounce, bounce. One, two, three, and the fourth one, that's when he shoots it. Finally, my percentage was up like 80, 90%. And then came time to shoot. The funniest thing was when we shot the single shot of him uh, at the basketball tryouts. Make two, we'll go home. And then we actually had the real basketball team lined up on the baseline. First, I was a little bit nervous, and you know, I was missing a bunch. We were sitting up the camera, I'm looking at Perry and Perry was literally missing the basket by four feet. Everybody on the team was just shaking their head. But you know what? He clutched it out, he made it on the fourth take. When I did it, it went.
You're being too nice to that fish. Ah, uh, good, good. Keep going. Keep... Hardly any downtime. People working for free. Came on board. It wasn't clear at first what I would contribute exactly. People working overtime. We knew the limitations, and we we're going to use that to our advantage. 14, 15, 16 hour days. I became the casting director, the loop group director, the second AD, an extra extraordinaire. Officially, I played the waitress, a hospital patient in a wheelchair, student at Steve's High School, grandmother, high school student at the car wash, at the prom, basketball game, New Year's Eve party, Susie's party, and just about pretty much every party. That's the first day I realized the true spirit of what better luck tomorrow is going to be. And that, I had no wig on. That is me. It's uh, deal with what you got. You know, don't complain. We know what we have and we barely had anything. There's certain things, you know, that I really wanted in this film. You know, I think one of the scenes that was important to me was when the guys got to the party. And I really wanted to be with them with the camera the whole way through. There had been times during the, the shoot that we did not have enough extras. It's supposed to be a huge party scene. We didn't have enough people. I went to the grocery store and I, I picked up some kids. She picked up neighborhood kids that looked like they were 11 and 12, just for like far, far in the background. Action! But in the end, we had about 20 people. We needed like 100. So I had constructed this kind of like fluid master of one shot as we follow them through. What happens when you go to a party? You see that the people are spilling out in the front and there's the people in the back. You know, as the camera's in the front of the house, we were gonna have everybody stand there as if they were spilling out. As soon as that camera went into that side patio, like going around the house to the back, Everybody jetted through the house. Some people like took off their jackets to like pretend they were wearing something else and we all ran to the back and then all of a sudden, okay, we stopped. And become the extras in the backyard. So we had the same extras in the front, in the back, in one shot, which I think is pretty, pretty amazing. My parents weren't too happy because uh, when they ran through the house, they destroyed my dad's garden, both in the front and in the back. We were told recently that a normal Hollywood film, just sitting around, they spend like 250000 a day. I started off where I just got 10 credit cards, took out my life savings. A $5 million film is considered a low-budget film. The budget we are on, I mean, that's not low-budget. That's like micro, but that's like, this, that's not a budget. You know, the only reason you make an independent film is if A, you're crazy, B, you are a stalwart artist individual, or C, basically no one else will believe in you. And I think we fell in under the last category. With all independent films, you know, it, it's the fundraising is probably the most frustrating part. Yeah, I basically tried anybody that I had connections to. Me and Justin, we met at a, a consumer electronics show. We talked for a little bit, and he gave me his contact number. So I, I, you know, I thought, what the hell? He started telling me about his ideas and uh, you know the films that he was looking to produce and where he was going with his career. I sent him the script, and, and he, he he loved it. Justin has a, a real honest personality. I think he believed in in me. He believed in the project, and he was just gonna back the passion. The, the fire that I saw in his eyes and desire and you know the quality of his work I said you know this is a guy that I would really like to be able to uh, you know get involved with and help out in any way that I could. It doesn't have to be about money it's about the person you know so I wanted to help out the person you know because I wanted to see him uh, you know fulfill the dream of better luck tomorrow. This is how you start you want to prove to him like look we can make a great film with Asian American actors and then if you could prove to them and then you show that you can make a profit, and then you're going to get another chance. And you're going to get another chance. In filmmaking, no matter how big the budget, you're always going to have obstacles. Example of this is like, 
we had a car tow, and this is where you know they drive the car up, okay. put the car on the tow. We shoot it as if they're driving. One night, we were in this parking lot, and uh, we had this low rider gangster car that we had to get onto a rig. Somehow, we just couldn't get it on there because you know there was just enough. It wasn't enough clearance. Literally, you could hear the money just because you're renting this truck. You had to have four police officers escorting this down the street. And I remember Roger thinking, wow, maybe you should put some sandbags. There's a plank underneath, underneath the ramp, like two inches up. We basically took these sandbags and put like one sandbag next to two sandbags next to three sandbags. But what was great about it was uh, it wasn't just the grips and the electric guys doing this. I remember standing in line and it was like a little, it was like Justin, me, the actors, the producers, the writers. Even when you plant everything out, there's always going to be something there that's going to throw you off. We're doing something so ridiculously small sometimes, but trying to, you know, keep our eye on the prize and knowing what it is that we ultimately wanted, which was to create the best movie that we could possibly do. And no job should be too big or too small for anyone. The big thing is that you know you want your film to get into a prestigious film festival. You go in expectations with every project you do of the best possible scenario. If you ever want a world premiere for an independent film, the best possible scenario is to get into Sundance. Sundance Film Festival. Probably the most prestigious independent film festival in the United States. It's the pinnacle for independent filmmaking. We had our wildest hope and dream was to get into Sundance. How realistic we thought that was, I mean, it was a whole different story. It was definitely not a guaranteed thing. I think we had enough presence of mind to know sort of where we stand. It's a challenge for a small film to get in. 1,500 independent films get made a year. Literally, only 16 films get into competition. But you kind of just have to make the best film you can. You turn it in and you hope for the best. Guys headed today? Uh, Sundance Film Festival. Well, go a little slower, will you? Okay. Need your signature here on the X, please. When the film is done, as we all found out, it's just the beginning of the next battle. We have to go out and we're going to have to find a home for this film. And that's probably even a bigger challenge. The audiences were being starved from a certain kind of menu of diversity. So suddenly there was a new opportunity for independent film. And you're trying to find someone who hopefully will champion your film, and take it in, and distribute it. Because independent film is not hampered by the restrictions that the straight commercial world is. You can afford to take risks and chances that others can't. Film just don't appear in theaters. Film has to be distributed by a distributor. This is the deal. I just need to go over this stuff with you. Okay. There's companies out there that will book it into theaters. These are all the ones that you pick. Just oh, great. Once you're done and you actually get into Sundance, you actually need more help. We were very fortunate because uh, we had two of the top reps in the business actually teaming up. This is John Sloss and Jeff Dowd. And these are people that's been in the business. They know the distributors and they're there to help you find the home. A lot of people could have question marks about this film. That's, that we know. Very few things are going to get picked up on the spot. Dowd and Sloss 
basically wanted to make sure that we were on the right page with them. I'm a believer of being at the distributor screen, get the cast out at the parties as much as possible with these guys, get them to where distributors are going to be. I don't think it's just schmoozing, I think it's more than that. We were able to kind of all sit down for the first time and really talk about the potentials of this film. There is a blue sky scenario that this becomes a youth picture that younger high school people want to see. There are a number of distributors who, can, who are smart who can get this out in the way that I'm talking about. You know, we're not going to go down and try to drag people to come in and watch it. You know what, they're going to hear about it, they're going to come see it on their own. This film's going to play for everybody tomorrow. I don't think it needs any more hype. The quality of the film is ultimately what it is. Tonight, um, what we're doing is We've been kind of laying low. The strategy from the reps and stuff is to kind of let people discover this film. What we're going to do is we're going to kind of split up and, and we're going to start postering the town. Is this enough or need more? It's like we're at war, we're just waiting, and now it's like the first strike we're going in. Our whole entire group went out, and we had like the posse, we had like the BLT posse. It looks like, according to Josh, we might have some bad poster karma by uh, over-blanketing the kiosk. Anybody want a poster? Right now? Hey man, we're less than 12 hours away from our premiere in Park City. I think it's about time. Hey guys, want a poster? I think having a, a world premiere anywhere is, is exciting. But I think especially at Park City, that's where you can really feel that energy. Are you guys here for the film festival? Yeah, I mean, I'm the filmmaker for the next film. There's a potential of seeing something that they've never seen before. There's a potential of a great film. I think just having all those elements together, when you get there, you can just feel the energy in the air. The first time in my life I've seen myself on the big screen, and first time I'm seeing the movies. You want the whole world to love this film, and this is the first time the whole world gets to see it. The lobby was just so crowded. And for some reason, that screening, like, it felt like it took forever. It was probably the, 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 the most tense moment of the festival. I knew that the first screening was going to be at the Echoes Theater, which is a 1,300-seat theater. You sit down, the lights go out, and it really is not until that first connection with the audience that I could actually even breathe. Thank you very much for coming. This is uh, amazing. We made the film that we wanted, and let's see what happens. I couldn't wait to get up on the, on the stage because I, you know, I could tell from the reaction that it was going to be good. Walking up onto that stage, I gotta say, it was like, to this point, the greatest moment in my acting career. I felt like this is what we have been working for since we started film school. For the first time in my career, I felt validated. The greatest thing about it was like the room was alive. They laughed the right spots. They were shocked at the right moments. And people just really got engaged with the film. It's almost at that point where you've done everything you can and now it's, 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 you have no control, you know, and that's actually a pretty good feeling. Good job. Dude, now we're going to party. <laughs> Hey, look, tomorrow's party. One to ten on a Richter scale, it was like busting out a 15. Everyone that was like that was involved with the film that could be there was there. People were jumping. People were dancing. We had so many people there. It was like a rap party. And I even remember at one, one point in the evening, and we all just huddled. Everyone's face was this, this look of just, just pure happiness. You're autographing, you're kind of going, Hey, you sure you want my autograph? Or do you think like I'm Jackie Chan or something like that, you know? And You know, it's true, when, when you're hot, it just goes fast. That buzz, I mean, literally, it just kind of spread. 
you know, you, you don't even see it coming. And All of a sudden, the, the cast now, they're celebrities. From that moment in time, you're like living the star life. Taking autographs, I have to take pictures. Everything felt really surreal. It was intense. Go interview, photo shoot. And we could not walk up or down that street. Interview, interview, interview. Without getting stopped every two feet. Quick, quick, get lunch, hurry up, get in line, get a sandwich. People coming up. Okay, take a bite, okay, we gotta go. Telling us how much they love the film. It's a great feeling to know that people aren't just doing that because we're not really big star or anything. But if you look at what's important about it, that we etched ourselves into the minds of a lot of the mainstream. Please welcome to the stage, Justin Lin. The distributor saw the film and they, they called the meeting, so we're going to go and see what happened. We went into our first meeting to discuss a possible distribution deal with which is a really respectable independent film distributor. We went in there very nervous. It was our first time doing this and we were really unsure of what was going to happen. All right, let's go. Good luck. Hey. No, that was cool. I mean, I enjoyed it, actually. But it's just too bad the ending. <laughs> you know what happened? Is they, the, the deal did not, it fell through. It's pretty upsetting at first, but after that, we just realized we had a lot more work to do with the film if uh, we were going to continue meeting with other distributors. After the first you know, negotiations fell through, you know, it was, it was definitely just gut-wrenching, you know, it was like, you have a, you, you, all hope is gone. I think all of us were expecting, you know, it was, it was kind of, it was too good, you know, it was like yeah. a perfect ending. We just sold our film four days into the festival. The third screening was coming about, we had like a few days in between where we reanalyzed our strategy. We need to okay. rally everyone together, get all the actors out, talking to people this afternoon. Just get that excitement going. We had hit the low and we were back on the upswing. The buzz is, is, is just gotten so high that the distributors are all coming in. Ebert's going to be on Wednesday. Oh, he's gonna you know, and we already have some big critics, champions, you know, but Ebert would be a great. We're close. I, I feel good. Everyone's feeling good about selling. Before the screening, we're like, you know, the film's doing good, but we really need, we really need something to happen that's going to ignite. We're halfway through, it's been, it's been amazing. This is a film that uh, it was made so that we could all kind of have the chance to talk. And I think the whole point a lot of time in the filmmaking is to bring out questions. We really wanted to kind of explore the issue uh, that, you know, I, that, that, that we were, I didn't want to wrap it up also in an hour and a half. To me, that's not the most important thing. To me, I think, you know, really it's about this generation. And when I work with kids today, I feel like they're almost shopping for identity. Take the time for one more. Get in the back, in the back. The thing was, like, other people just jumped up and started arguing with him. What we're dealing with is what happens with the American male in a situation where you have to, where you this have to succeed. This is a service to this talent up there, right? Talking about it in that way. It is. You know what? You know what? This is great that everyone got stirred up. You know what I'm saying? 
Brothers, right on! I have read my share of scripts in town. I've been doing this for eight years. I have to tell you that this was the most damn progressive script for Asian Americans I've ever seen in my life. And then all of a sudden, like, Roger Ebert stands up. I was on a panel today with Chris Hare, the Native uh, American director. And he said that for a long time his people, uh, American Indians, had always had to play some kind of a function, like they were the source of spirituality. And what I uh, find very offensive and condescending about your statement is nobody would say to a bunch of white filmmakers, how could you do this to your people? Yeah. This film has the right to be about these people, and Asian American characters have the right to be whoever the hell they want to be. They do not have to represent their people. Our film created so much controversy that we could not be ignored. If Scorsese, nobody said to Scorsese, why are you portraying white people or Italian Americans this way? Justin had a vision to do this film and he did it the way he wanted to do it. You're making a good movie. That's what you're doing. And that's the best thing you can do. We went from no one knowing what Better Luck Tomorrow was to becoming this buzzword, BLT, BLT. Oh. We didn't realize it, but so much was writing on that screen. Okay, okay. Things are coming in so fast right now, I just wanted to at least let you know about that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The, the other people interested in MTV, they're still gung-ho about it. I think if you if you want to let him know, I think that's fine with me. Hello. <laughs> ah, oh, yeah. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> this is awesome. He's like, if you go with MTV and if it all works out, this is gonna catapult this film to like a new level. This will be the first acquisition by MTV. At MTV, it's very rare that we find somebody who has both um, a command of storytelling and at the same time has a style and a sensibility um, as a filmmaker that our audience responds to. When I saw Better Luck Tomorrow was something that I, that I instantly knew was, was perfect for our brand. The great thing about this movie is it's from a completely unique perspective that we haven't seen before and at the same time it's a universal story. For Asian American filmmakers we're hoping that we can help blow the door open and for us as MTV we can't afford to fail. This is the first movie that we've bought and we're not gonna we're not gonna fail. We're gonna make this work. Hi there, I'm Sujin Park with MTV News. Better Luck Tomorrow, film directed by Justin Lin, was acquired by MTV Films in early 2002. It's a first in many respects. It's the first Asian American film to be picked up at the Sundance Film Festival, and it's the first film acquired by MTV Films, which is a monumental achievement furthering the future of Asian American cinema. going back left okay sounds rolling still rolling speed mark okay good Amy perfect Amy action Something else, brother! You guys give it like, like a thousand percent. So thank you. Thank you. Woo! Woo!
So it's our last day. And uh, it's been a glorious comedy, working on a comedy like this. It's been great, you know, and Dustin, Dustin Schwen, I mean, he's a great director. You know? And, um, you know, just the, 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 the cast, working with uh, Mason and uh, uh, Barry and uh, the Chinese dude, uh, whatever his name is, tall guy with the long hair. It was really great, you know, and um, I will hold this memory for the rest of my life. And uh, we'll see ya. We'll see you on the big screen, baby. Were we competitive? Tokyo, Japan. Well, at all. Can't wait to go to college, man. All that studying finally pays off and you get to leave this hellhole. Were we bored? We will see a movie. The Amoeba. To death. Do this by tomorrow, you get a 50. What? We don't have to play by the rules. We can make our own. It's easy money. It'll be fun. We were putting the laws of supply and demand into practice. And then, it snowballed. You think you can break in? There's gonna be a lot of money involved. Our straight A's were our alibis. As long as our grades were there, we were trusted. You think you can get away with anything, don't you? Oh, yeah, if you're clever enough. Woo! We were making so much money, we couldn't spend it fast enough. What do you think he is, some Chinese movie stuff? Hi, I am Chow Yun Fat. Rumors about us came and went fast and furious. So how does it feel to be famous? It's better than sex. The more notorious we became, the more invitations we got. We didn't know half the people we partied with. What are you guys? A club. Oh, like a math club or something? <laughs> you know how you make decisions that lead to other decisions? It's gonna get us caught! Then you don't remember why you made those decisions in the first place? Get the gun! Get the gun! Uh, Boom! Everybody, everybody, come on! When you got everything you want, what's left? You can't settle for being happy, that's a trap. Study hard. <laughs>